I'm Stefan Bauman and welcome to another podcast. Today we have a lot of information that we're going to be covering, but primarily we're going to call this episode Passion, Grace, and Mystery. This episode is so packed with so many issues and so many comments and so many things. We're going to be talking about shadows and backgrounds, temperature, we're going to discuss kuroskuro, the, the, the feeling of an object coming out of the shadows. We're going to be talking about edges and we're going to end the conversation with a dialogue of what I believe abstract art should be. I know a lot of people try to approach that conversation and of course I feel that my definition of abstract art is the correct one. But listen in and see whether or not it resonates with you. So sit back and relax and enjoy this wonderful episode with my Zoom classes from my Patreon group. Well, good morning to you, everyone. Today is a bonus day. Uh, there are five weeks in the month, and so uh, five Saturdays. So normally the first week is uh, the first tier of the Zoom calls, and then the second week is the second tier. The third week is the third tier. Of course, the third tier Zoom calls can all be, uh, they can watch all of them. And then the fourth tier, I decided to give to the $5 tier again, so they get an extra week along with everyone else. And today is a bonus week. And so I was like, okay, what am I gonna do with this? You know, for those of you who think it's a big deal to do a work of, uh, you know, a homework assignment in like one, one week, uh, I want you to pay attention to Brenda's work today because I think she's got four or five plus a lot of other work. So, I mean, you know, the, the, the paintings are stacked in her favor, but the thing is she's painting with passion. And that's kind of what we're going to be discussing today at some point. Um, I decided since this is a bonus week, I was going to try actually having a theme. And I don't know how that's going to work, but we'll see how that works. But uh, I was talking with one of my uh, coaching students in England today, and she was doing a study of koi fish. And I was like totally inspired. I love her work, and she's just, you know, just ma marvelous. And, you know, for, for those of you who don't take my coaching, it really is um, a different level because we really talk about things in a much deeper level. And, and yeah, I, I, I looked at her work and I said, you know, I said the painting, you know, painting lacks, it's got the passion. because She's very passionate. She's a, she's a redhead and she's, she's down to the, to the core, um, passionate about um, her work. And she's um, Hungarian and she lives in, in England. So you can kind of imagine what's going on with everything she's doing. But she paints with passion. But I think that um, her work missed a little grace. And I think she could have had a little bit more mystery. And I thought, oh my God, that's just really a great topic that we could kind of include in our, in our topic today. And that is, so we're gonna call this, this session, Passion, Mystery, and Grace. So we're gonna be looking for those three things. Uh, you know, the effect of light, but the thing is what you're lacking is shadow. So what do you know about temperature? Well, I have watched a lot of your videos and stuff and about using the warm colors for shadows, um, you know, and the cool colors for highlights. And okay. So I was trying to, you know, work that in. So if, you, if you've listened to some of my videos, I tell you that you should have 90% shadows. Right. So looking at this, would you say that there's a lot of shadow in here? No. So what do you think is missing? Part of part of the, one of the conversations we'll have a little bit later because it was a question that Brenda had, or was it you? I can't remember. I copied it in the question section, but it's like, you know, what's an apropos background, you know, in a painting? So the whole idea behind backgrounds is that you want to create a background that uh, actually creates a sense of mystery. See how we work that in again? Yeah, we have passion, grace, and mystery. So we want mystery in your painting. So the backgrounds, not only, when things go into shadow, they get warm. 
when things go into shadow, they get mysterious. You know, there's no more light in them. You know, it's it's almost like the air disapp disappears. And so when you're doing a background, you know, the old masters were doing it best, is that they would have a dark background and they would do kuroskuro, where it's like, the, you know, the background emerging from the light. And if you listen to David LaFell and some of these old master painters, um, they, you know, there's a reason why they paint that way is because it's always coming out from, from the darkness. Now, there are a lot of paintings that go, oh, Stefan, all you know is dark. It's like, no, it's got to be warm. So if we look at a painting by Vermeer as opposed to a painting by Rembrandt, Rembrandt had these dark, luxurious backgrounds. And when you looked at them, a lot of them didn't even have a wall. It was just air. And if you listen to David LaFell, um, he's really passionate. And his work's got a lot of grace. But he has a lot of mystery because his backgrounds are not even like a real background. You kind of sense the air that creates the mystery. And so, you know, when you're putting a background in, it's kind of good to try to, you know, you could paint a wall of wallpaper and background. But if you do kuroskuro, like out of the smoke, out of the out of thing, is actually just to have a dark area that illuminates light here and there and gives us an idea that there is a background behind there. And again, this is a lot of like, you know, mental mental exercises here where you're like going, huh, no background, but air, it's dark. Um, and so the only thing I could say to help you with that is, you know, if, if you have a really good light, you focus that light onto something. And then, you know, you have, in order to create the effect of light, here again too, one of my keys is the, the angle. And we saw this in Peggy's painting, is that, you know, getting the, the, that donut correct is gonna make a difference. And, and, you know, it's like the center focal point in this painting is a donut. And then you wonder, well, that vertical cup has got a lot of light too. And then you kind of have, you know, the, the, the other donut and the, and the thing in back. So you want to kind of really focus in on getting the lighting effect much clearer on like on the donut itself. And so right here, if we have really that really light that's hitting it, then everything else in kind of uh, different degree, degrees of shadow um, and taking this out. And then the background actually even darkening even so, you know, like just, just a really warm, dark background. And then, you know, create a little bit of mystery by having part of the cup disappear into that. Uh, have part of your, the, the edges on the edge of the, edge of the uh, plate here. You know, people say, well, how do you make your paintings look more professional? It's like actually, you know, eliminating things. And so when we were talking about, um, with Jeannie, um, we were talking about the, the uh, lighthouse. And I go, you know, part of part of the lighthouse is not to illustrate it too much. And when you're doing this, it's like it's so illustrated. It's like, see how the, the cup touches the edge of the uh, saucer? You know, soften that and soften that and soften the lines hitting the cup. Um, soften these intersections. And when you start softening those, your, your images become more three-dimensional. That's how you start making your paintings look more and more professional. So um, that's very good. Here we have that, and then we have uh, his letter. And he says, uh, Hi, Stefan. Uh, I live in Turkey. Unfortunately, I can't seem to connect with Zoom, uh, probably because my broadband width isn't totally in a, it's inadequate. And I know what that is, because <laughs> mine is too. Um, I'm still waiting for Starlink to, to happen, and hopefully that changes. Um, I will provide some insight into what I was thinking. We're actually going to go back to looking at the paintings a bit, so and we'll talk about this. But he he says a couple of questions that I thought would be interesting to to answer uh, in our in our conversation here. As as you can't ask me questions directly or vice versa, I will provide some insights to what I was thinking. I've watched many of your videos and listened to your podcast. I was particularly struck by your explanation for the need niche. So we were talking about a niche market and dealing with a niche market and, and if it was a good idea or not. That's one of the questions we'll come up um, and talk about. Um, I live in an area with 13 top class uh, golf courses. And it's funny when you think about Turkey, you don't think about golf courses. 
um, within a 15 minute drive. Most are uh, attached to extremely expensive hotels filled with many wealthy golfers from Europe and Asia. So you could see where the niche is starting to, uh, you know, kind of, kind of build here. It's like, okay, they're wealthy people. There's golf courses. I've been painting since the lockdown, initially watercolor, then acrylic. At least six months, uh, I moved to oils. So that's a good thing. Um, as, as the high temperature here and others dry the, at the moment that they touch the canvas. So that's one of the things with acrylics, but you can kind of retard them. Watercolor is kind of tough because you're constantly having to deal with that paper. I understand the importance of painting the effect of light rather than painting things. In these paintings, I was trying to capture the awesomeness of the course and nature rather than the jolly round of, gore, of the golf course. I'm improving steadily and would appreciate a critique of these two paintings, um, which are close to where he lives. So that's, that's his question. And I'm going to go back to my Zoom call here so we can actually look at these two paintings, talk about addressing the niche. We have a few questions that we want to kind of cover. This is one of the things I want to do with you know, our time here is to really dig in. Now, one of the things I sent back and I said, you know, I think to really get into your painting, probably the best thing to do would be to actually take some coaching one-on-one uh, -on -one because of his broadband. And, it's, and, you know, he can't really participate and stand up for his artwork here. So these are his two paintings. And so he talks about painting into a niche. And the problem with painting into a niche is, is yeah, you could sit and, and focus your niche like a product. And so your niche would be these golf course paintings. And, uh, yeah, it's like, okay, well, golf course people have lots of money. Golf course people have, you know, interest in golf, obviously. Uh, one of the worst kind of person you can actually paint for is a golf course person because they have certain demands that they want and that's all they see. So for instance, at one point in my life, I got uh, a commission to do a golf course, La Rinconada in Los Gatos. And that golf course is, is a very wealthy golf course area and uh, very exclusive. And their, their, their theme is that they have the whitest sands, you know, the, the sand traps are the whitest in the business. And uh, so when I was originally approached, it was a $10,000 commission. So it was a major commission. I wanted to, to definitely do it. So it was for their lobby. And, you know, the, this, lo this place where they were, you know, their, their resort there was in the middle of their golf course. And so I kind of went there and I go, you know, every one of these windows has a view of their holes, you know, different holes that they're at. And I was like, you know, we could rise above that. They've got all this golf stuff. Wouldn't it be impressive that in their in their uh, uh, restaurant there, um, in their lobby, wouldn't it be impressive if they had a gigantic Yosemite scene, the entire friggin' valley, and you know, and, and you know, just this incredible masterpiece to show that yeah, we love golf, but we also love art, you know. And so I was pitching like, let's just go all out and do this incredible huge. And the painting was like eight feet by 18 feet. It was huge, you know, for this big room. And they go, no, nope, we don't want that. We want the 19th green. And I was like, it's right out there. The window. I don't care. I went, and I was like, oh, I was so defeated. And so I painted the painting, did all my artistic stuff, really. Uh, and so they put it up and then they said, you should come over to dinner and see it in person. We'll have all these people come in. And I thought, oh, great. I've, yeah. And they said, oh, there's a little touch up you have to do. And I said, OK, I'll bring my paints. You know, we can fix that. So I get there and immediately I'm ushered to the painting and they go, you see those sand traps? And there were like six of them in the painting. They go, we're known as having the whitest sand traps. And these don't look white enough. I was like, if I make them any whiter, they're going to look like snow like piles of snow. And they go, we don't care. So I sat there instead of eating dinner, you know, I was like correcting sand traps, putting snow mounds in the middle of the painting. Well, yeah, it just kind of was the worst disaster. I still got paid for it, but 
kind of have to watch doing paintings for golfers because they really just want to focus in on, on their, their thing. But I digress. Like I said, I could tell stories forever. But the thing that I want to get at is if you're going to develop a niche to painting, first of you got to kind of consider, do you really want to paint white sand traps the rest of your life? And then you kind of have to ask yourself, really? That's you know, kind of a small niche and it's so clustered uh, that you know, you're kind of limiting yourself to your subject matter that, um, that you paint. And you know, from the sounds of it, I don't hear that he's really uh, a, a landscape, you know, a, a, a park painter. I mean, he's watching me paint Yosemite and the Grand Canyon and here he's bringing that to here. It's like, there's a road uh, back in the day at St. Louis, the, the Oregon Trail started in St. Louis. And there was a sign there that said, choose your rut wisely. You're going to be in it for a very long time. And so all these ruts going to California were very deep. And once you lowered your cart into it, you couldn't get it out. And so the, the, the thing to learn here is that, you know, be very careful if your niche is this, because your market is limited, your expectations are limited, and you'll find yourself after a period of time really regretting this niche. And art should be autobiographical. It should be about your life. If you love nature, fabulous. If you love golf, fabulous. You know, you can, you can really fall in love with some of these beautiful golf course places. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that saying to yourself, that's going to be my niche and, and forego painting your wife, your kids, you know, vacations and things like that. That's kind of limited. You know, I, I much rather have, uh, you know, my niche be more about mystery, you know, something that has mystery, something that has grace and something that I'm passionate about, something I really, really love. So when we're talking about niches, we want to make sure that, that we find something that we're passionate about. Um, these paintings here, first thing, they, they're, they're thing paintings. And you know, that's one thing that you get into doing a golf painting. I did this beautiful 19th green painting. You know, it was, it was gorgeous, but it was a thing painting. It didn't have beautiful effect of dapple lighting. It didn't have, it had a big lawn in it with a flag and a bunch of snow banks, you know? So it was like, you know, uh, that that's not passionate. And, you know, I lost interest in it real quickly and I've never done another park scene again. But when I'm looking at, at your two paintings that you have here, um, and thank you for being part of Patreon, even though, you know, you live in Turkey, I know you're watching the, the um, you know, the, re, the rehashes of these. Your center focal point should be in the middle of the painting somewhere. And I would suggest to go to the Patreon site for Stefan Bauman and download the, you know, my keys, the Bauman keys, because all of these things are all covered in there. The center focal point should be in the center third. The center focal point should be the effect of light. And so your center focal points are, are kind of all over in your paintings. You, I can't tell, you know, the effect of light. I can't tell which direction the light is coming from on these paintings. You know, I'm not sure if it's from the left or from the right. You should have eye magnets that bring you around. And if you look at your paintings here on the screen, your painting, you know, these lines all lead you out. There's nothing that brings you back in. And that's why I think a lot of times people kind of try to learn how to paint on their own. And really, you could paint like this for the next 10 years until you start correcting. There are things that I teach now that I learned after 30 years of teaching. And, and I go, oh my God, that's a game changer. And it took me 30 years. Of course, we didn't have the internet when I first started painting. So um, there's just a lot to, to decide you know, on your niche. I could tell you if you're painting for money, I have another story and I won't bore you with it, but I've mentioned it in some of my other things. But that's shallow too, because, you know, it, it, it's like, yeah, it's great to, to but it, the best thing is to have something that you love, you're passionate, and you're painting, you know, and you can sell it. If you're painting things uh, for money, you'll lose your, your, your muse, your, your passion. I would suggest to kind of rethink your marketing. 
I would suggest not painting necessarily for the golf course unless this is your passion. But then what I would like to see in your paintings is your passion in your paintings, not just a rendering of golf courses. So it's just kind of something to kind of think about. Um, given whatever assignments going forward, can we be abstract? Oh, yeah. You know, the thing is, uh, as we saw with Mary's painting, we can be abstract. So she, so she said, in case some of you, because of your Wi-Fi and my Wi-Fi, what she said is, you know, is it okay to be abstract? Um, I didn't feel that his paintings were, were abstract. I feel like he put a lot of stuff in the painting. And what made them look, it, they felt more disjointed. You know, all these pieces of stuff was, weren't really related to each other. Um, and so when we saw Mary's painting, that's an abstract painting. Uh, oftentimes, abstract painting has an interpretation of something, and yet it's still kind of, kind of uh, uh, out there as far as as far as the rendering is that they're 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 not visually trying to render a thing, but it still has passion and feeling to it and um, some grace um, to it too. It should connect with the viewer. But it shouldn't be just a scribble. Back in the 70s, the abstract art was uh, squares and circles and, and put together with lines. And there are a lot of artists that kind of still hang on to it. And I guess that's a thing. I don't want to be noted as, as you know, somebody that's really down in abstract. But to me, this is, this is the definition of abstract. It's like I look at something in a gallery and I stare at it and I go, man, I feel something. I really feel something in this. And I go walk up to the tile and, I, and it says love. And I step back and I look at it and go, yeah, that's what I felt. I felt, I felt that. That confirmed what it is that I felt. I mean, it's even better if you actually look at it and go, oh my God, this, I sense something here. And I've seen abstracts that do that, that move you. Um, and, you know, painting is silent poetry. It shouldn't have, uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be literal, but it has to be connected. And a lot of times what happens is people say, well, if you don't get it, then don't look at it. And it's like gibberish. If I could sit and talk gibberish, and if you don't understand it, and I go, well, if you don't understand it, big deal. Yeah, it's a really lonely world. Yeah, when we, when we look at abstract music, when we look at abstract um, art, it should strive to have a deeper conversation than just it being something. You know, just, just a bunch of scrapes on the wall. It should move you. There should be a feeling to it that connects the humanity of who we are uh, into a thought. We're not just somebody that, that can take uh, stories and, and believe in, you know, untruths. We want to be people that connect as a community. And sometimes reality doesn't quite reach deep enough. Think about, how would you express love? Just think about that for a sec. And we all know what that is. Not all of us feel it. Not all of us get love. But we kind of know what that definition is. But even the, the, the term love what isn't... What? It's a what? What color is love? Well, what you know... Love? Yeah, well, we don't really... You know, we're, we're, we're sold to that on Valentine's Day. Right? So red is the color of love. But is it really that too? And so when you start thinking about, you know, expressing a human emotion, we almost have to go into abstract. And we almost have to like really dwell into it to discover what that is. You know, and there's some artists that, that kind of find that. And it's in that discovery that we as humans become bigger. We as humans become uh, expanded in our thoughts and, and our ideas and we learn different ways to communicate by reading poetry and reading um, other forms. Music is, is really one of the biggest connections that you can have and I'm talking about wordless music although word, you know, words to music is poetry and you know just poetry alone can have you thinking and it doesn't even have to be good all it has to do is cause you to think but nowhere in any of the arts do you, are you allowed just a free get out of jail pass where you could just do whatever you want and we're supposed to swallow it. We're supposed to say, well, it's, it's abstract art. Well, there's a lot of abstract garbage out there. 
And it's okay to call it garbage. And some of you who produce it actually know what that is. But if you want to hold the arts to a certain standard, art is communication. Art is communication without words. It's, it's trying to communicate feelings that sometimes words don't connect to. And we communicate at a deeper uh, sensual level that is our soul. It's, it's what makes us human. An elephant taking a paintbrush and doing abstract art is disconnected to what it is to be human. So my advice would be, if you're gonna do abstract art, don't reach for low-hanging fruit. Rise up high and try to do something. Uh, you don't get a, a gold medal by doing a perfect swan dive on a diving board that's the short one. You have to climb your, the highest diving board and you have to do a perfect swan dive from up there. And if you mess up, it hurts. It hurts. If you've ever jumped off of a diving board and you don't hit the water right, it hurts. And your art should be that way. You, should, you strive for something that is perfection. And if, you, and if it doesn't land, that hurts. Don't share it. Well, there was a lot of information on this particular podcast, yes, and if you'd like to get some more, please feel free to go through my podcast listed anywhere that you get podcasts. I also have them on YouTube, plus another 300 videos that discuss everything you need to know about painting. Of course, if you want to come to one of my workshops or personally study with me on a weekly basis, it's not expensive, and believe me, it will make a difference from the first minute that you start working with me, you can just give me a call at 415-606-9074. All this information is available on my website at www.stephenbauman.com where you're there you can download a free book, Everything I Know About Painting. But do take advantage of the information that I have there. I There's a lot. I'm passionate about teaching. All you need to do is just go to my website, give me a call for coaching, go to YouTube, go to my Patreon site, and I'm also writing a book on painting, The Field Guide to Landscape Painting by Stefan Bauman. So there's a lot happening. So if you want to join us, find a way, go to my website, at least download that free book and start there. And I'm anxiously waiting by my phone if you want to give me a call. The coaching calls are personal. I'm not going to sell you a program or anything. You just call me and we'll talk. And what can I say? It will change your life forever. So get out there. Give me a call at 415-606-9074. Do that right now. Chances are I am free and by my phone. I carry my phone all over. So do that at 415-606-9074. And I hope you have a fabulous and wonderful day.